as I think would be very familiar in this room, um, in the last two years, uh, we've just had the two-year anniversary of the earthquake in Haiti, and of the five most costly earthquakes for the uh, international insurance industry, four of them have occurred in the last two years. Earthquake is very much an issue on people's mind. Uh, it's been a, a issue that's led to lots of questions, and I'm sure you're trying to field and answer and cope with in terms of what are the risks here for our country. And uh, we're proud that uh, there's just a wonderful group of people who are going to share with you today their research and their analysis of what's happening in Canada. Um, the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction is very proud of our affiliation with Canadian Seismic Research Network. Uh, Dennis Mitchell is going to explain what the network is and how it's operating for those who are not familiar with the network. But uh, it's brought together the top seismic researchers in Canada under the overall goal of reducing seismic risk in urban centers uh, across the country. And uh, this is an incredibly important initiative and um, is leading to some really exciting findings that you'll hear part of today, but there's just absolutely a lot more going on that we can talk to you about in just one day. Uh, part of uh, the presentations being done today, uh, they were done earlier um, in Montreal, in Ottawa, and next week will be Vancouver. So this is a roadshow being taken across the country. Uh, most of the other presentations were done primarily for an academic type audience and um, uh, opening up today's discussion to talk with people in the insurance industry is something that we're trying. It's a little bit different and uh, we're really pleased with the turnout and of your interest. But we're really looking for your feedback on what you hear today and what uh, you learn from today's experience. This is part of the Institute trying to partner with the network to make sure that we're bringing to you the most current research of what's uh, understood and being discovered and, uh, and we, we are now learning about uh, managing seismic risk in this country. So we have a really exciting program. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start off by turning it over to Dennis Mitchell to talk a little bit about the Canadian Seismic Research Network. Dennis. Let me just clear the screen here first. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, we have a packed program today, as you've seen. Uh, we've removed all of the equations from our presentations uh, for different audiences, and, and so uh, you'll be pleased to hear that. Um, we'll start off by, I will be giving a presentation on the Canadian Seismic Research Network. Um, this is a network that is underway. It's a five-year program. Uh, the network goal is to reduce urban seismic risk. It's funded by the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. And we're into year four now. So we're coming towards the end of our program. And it's a delight to be able to give this, these presentations to you today to show you what we've done. First of all, I'd like to explain that in our network, we have three research themes. Theme one is on hazard assessment. That's the seismicity part, the microzonation part that we'll be focusing on uh, in this present, in this workshop today. Uh, theme number two is vulnerability assessment, or for the structural side, it would be evaluation of existing structures, buildings and bridges. Theme three is on mitigation. How, how can we reduce the risk by retrofitting structures so they have an improved seismic performance. Our deliverables are shown at the bottom of this slide. We have microzonation of Vancouver, Montreal, and Ottawa. One of the major deliverables in addition to that is a development of seismic evaluation and retrofit guidelines for structures to reduce the risk. And then we'll also be looking at scenarios for policy and planning decisions. Now, I don't want to get into too much detail here, but those three themes, one, two, and three, are linked together uh, and is shown on this slide. For example, if we're looking at evaluating the seismic risk of a particular structure, we would go to theme one first, the light blue ones that you see up on top here. Oops, it's not working. Um, <clears throat> we would look at the seismic hazard, of course, We'd use the microzonation information we have. And we would look at probable site ground motions, in other words, acceleration time histories. And we'd take those acceleration time histories, and we'd subject our structure to a suite of acceleration time histories to look on the computer 
uh, how the structure could respond. And from that response, we would determine the damage and the probable loss. And then we would ask ourselves whether or not we have acceptable performance for that existing structure. If yes, it's fine, the game is over. If no, we would go to theme three, which is the mitigation measures, and look at retrofitting the structure, and then again reanalyzing it to see whether or not we've improved it enough to get acceptable performance. Now, one interesting aspect is, is to put this together visually for you here. Uh, you see the microzonation map, uh, part of the island of Montreal. From that, we would then go to the um, go to the developing the ground motions, acceleration time histories, and then we would look at the response of the structure. And notice that in predicting the response of the structure, it's reversed cyclic loading. And that's one of the problems with earthquakes, is it subjects the structures to reverse cyclic loading. And that's a very, very severe type of loading. And that's why it's very challenging to design structures to resist earthquakes. We have in the network 26 researchers from eight universities across the country, McGill, Ecole Polytechnique, both in Montreal, uh, University of Sherbrooke, Carleton University, University of Ottawa, University of Toronto, University of Western Ontario, and of course, University of British Columbia. If we look at theme one, hazard assessment, we're fortunate that Gail Atkinson will be here today to give presentations on the hazard assessment. She's the leader of theme one, and I won't get into any details here because Gail will be giving a full explanation of what she's been up to with the other researchers. Theme two is on vulnerability assessment. The theme leader is Patrick Polt from the University of Sherbrooke, and we have a number of uh, sub-programs underneath that called projects. For example, project 2.1 uh, is looking at an inventory of deficiencies, which we've already uh, completed. These are the deficiencies in existing structures that could cause problems. And we're developing rapid screening techniques so we can evaluate a structure very quickly, as opposed to a very detailed evaluation, such as I showed you earlier. And of course, we're looking at buildings and bridges, and we're also very interested in post-disaster structures such as hospitals. For example, on the right you see the St. Justin Hospital in Montreal, which was undergoing a retrofit to add a shear wall at this end of this wing. And so it's going to be interconnected with the existing structure. So things are underway with the retrofit of structures in Canada, but a lot more has to be done. Project 2.2 is on masonry buildings. We'll be looking at testing and analysis of masonry structures. And of course, unreinforced masonry uh, is, is a real problem because of its brittle nature. We also have infilled masonry frames where the masonry is placed in a frame. Uh, we know very well from the Saguenay earthquake that the Montreal East City Hall, which was some 300 kilometers from the epicenter, uh, suffered damage. And fortunately, the, de the earthquake hit Montreal a little after 6 p.m. and no one was walking out of the front door. Otherwise, we would have had some casualties. Looking at masonry infilled walls, we have two different types of loading that we're looking at for masonry. Uh, one is called in-plane loading, where we're using hydraulic jacks to simulate the reverse cyclic loading from the earthquake and the loading is in the plane of the wall. In this particular case, we see an infilled uh, masonry wall inside a steel frame. And this research is going on at uh, the University of Sherbrooke, and they're looking at terracotta infilled walls and a lot of older structures in Quebec, particularly schools, have terracotta infilled walls, which are very brittle. The, some of the testing that's going on at the University of British Columbia 
they have the major schools project, upgrading of schools. Uh, so that's, there's a lot of tests related to that. But this is another type of testing that we're looking at where this masonry wall is subjected to reverse cyclic loading out of the plane of the wall. In other words, if the wall isn't properly connected at the top to the existing frame, then you can have collapse of the wall out of plane. So this is another interesting aspect that we're looking at with these full-scale tests. Project 2.3 is on reinforced concrete buildings, and we're doing a lot of large-scale testing and analysis of concrete frames, looking at the drift limits, how much the building laterally deflects. That's very important to us. And you can see here with this hospital in Mexico City that collapsed in the 1985 earthquake, we have a drift or lateral displacement of three meters. Uh, this is a hospital. It should be very carefully designed with extra safety in order to survive and be fully functional after an earthquake because it's a post-disaster structure. So we obviously have to focus on these types of structures. We're also looking at concrete shear walls. And here's a shear wall that failed in, in shear, a very brittle type of failure at the ground story level of a school in Kobe in 1995. Now, I thought I would just give you a little quick lesson, uh, behavioral aspects of what we have to look out for. And I'm using, as an example, reinforced concrete, a reinforced concrete column. If we take a look at the response of this reinforced concrete column to reverse cyclic loading, as the earthquake has acceleration going to the left, the column would move to the right at the top, okay? the inertial effects. And when it does that, we would get a bending or flexural crack on this side of the column. And we would have a shear crack, a diagonal crack, that looks like this coming from the left side of the column. Now, when the motion reverses and we get acceleration to the right, that's the pointer has giving trouble, to the right, then the column deflects to the left. That's the reverse cyclic loading effect. And what we see is the flexural cracking occurs on the other face of the column near the base. And the shear cracking or inclined cracking comes from the other side. So that what you end up with, with reverse cyclic loading, is this X-shaped shear cracking, very damaging, and flexural cracks that go right through the thickness of the column. Now, what we put in the column are hoops. And these hoops, if they're closely spaced, would control the shear cracking. Um, and if we take a look at other cycles, we start to lose the cover concrete over the reinforcing bars. And this exposes the reinforcement, and you can actually get buckling uh, of the bars. And so this is the reverse cyclic loading effects that are very, very severe um, that we simulate by carrying out reverse cyclic loading tests in our lab. Now, if you take a look at the hoops that are in there, these are, these are pieces of reinforcing bars that are bent around the longitudinal or vertical bars in the column. And they should be closely spaced. And there should be additional hoops placed to get very good confinement of the concrete inside the hoops, as opposed to this uh, very large spacing case on the left. And just to give you an example, that details matter. And that's a real challenge for us. If you look at the hoop anchorage details, uh, older structures typically have 90 degree bend anchorages at the end of the hooks here to anchor the hoops. And when the concrete cover comes off due to the reverse cyclic loading, uh, then the anchorage is lost and the hoops become ineffective and cannot prevent the shear failure I was talking about. However, if it's properly designed according to current codes, then we would bend not through 90 but 135 degrees to anchor the tail ends of the hoops inside the core of the concrete so that even when we get 
spalling or loss of the concrete cover, the hoops are still effective. And I just wanted to give you this quote that earthquake effects have a habit on structures of systematically bringing out the mistakes made in design and construction. Even the smallest of mistakes, even the smallest detail, such as the anchorage of the hoop at the very end of the hoop. And to me, this is the ultimate challenge that we face in earthquake resistant design and evaluating existing deficient structures. Just to give you an example, in the 1994 Northridge earthquake, this is a column that Rennie Tanawi and I uh, visited in 1994. It's a parking garage structure. You can see the X-shaped shear cracking here. You can see the loss of the concrete cover over the reinforcement. You can see the tail ends of the hoops are now ineffective because they had 90 degree bend anchorages. You can see the buckling of the bars and in fact the reinforcement is lapped, this bar with a bar coming from the bottom coming up through the floor slab. So we call that a lap splice as well. So that's a very brittle type of failure and we want to avoid those types of failures. In the Chile earthquake, this is a bridge column that failed and you'd say, well, where's the X-shaped shear cracking? Well, there isn't any X-shaped shear cracking. The bridge column was so poorly detailed and the ground motions were so strong that it failed on the first major excursion in one direction, failing in shear. This is a condominium building, 18 stories high, that had severe distress, near collapse, in the Chilean earthquake of 2010. And one similar building collapsed in Concepcion. You might have remembered seeing the photographs of that. Well, what happened during the earthquake, the wall had some, the shear wall, had crushing just in the parking level. And you can see the type of distress in this shear wall. It was a very thin wall, which is very difficult to give proper details to. And you can see that the, the ends anchorages of the reinforcement had 90 degree bend, bends as well, another, another deficiency. Well, we're carrying out a lot of research at Ecole Polytechnique in Montreal. We're looking at shake table testing of shear walls. Here's a shear wall shaking the shear wall here, and these are masses that are attached to the wall to give the inertial forces on the wall as the base is shaking. And so that's one type of uh, experimental work that we're carrying out. For steel structures, we're looking at large-scale testing as well, for, particularly for braced frame structures where you have the bracing inside the building that you'd be familiar with, and looking at connections. And this shows a hollow box steel corner column uh, that was severely damaged in the Mexico City earthquake of 1985. So steel structures are not immune um, from deficiencies as well. And the building next to this 14-story building totally collapsed because of this defect. We have another project on what we call operational and functional components. These are the non-structural components in, in a building. And they give a lot of safety hazards for existing buildings and we often see failures. And we cannot afford to have failures, particularly in post-disaster structures where all of the equipment, the non-structural elements, have to be fully functional after an event. And it just gives you an idea on the right here that for a moderate, earth, for a moderate to severe, severe earthquake, for example, for a hospital, you get some 48% of the damage would be from the uh, operational and functional components, only 8% for the structural damage. But of course, the damage to the non-structural is also a function of the response of the structure. So it's a very complex issue. Theme three on mitigation, the theme leader is uh, Professor Murat Satyuglu from the University of Ottawa who will be presenting uh, this afternoon to you. And looking at project 3.1, we're looking at upgrading structures with supplemental damping devices. For example, if you put this diagonal brace in the structure and it has some uh, damping abilities, it's like a piston 
which when it goes into tension or compression, it absorbs energy just like a shock uh, absorber in your car. So these are some of the new ideas that are coming out and also very good for retrofitting or rehabilitating deficient structures. For steel structures, there's a joint project between Ecole Polytechnique and McGill University looking at the development of braces with fuses in them. In other words, giving a reduced section of the brace at, at defined locations, as you can see here, so that when the earthquake hits, say, pushing in this direction, this brace is in tension, and all of the inelasticity and deformations would take place at the predetermined fuse. And the rest of the connections and whatnot would be protected. So this is one other idea we're looking at. A lot of experimental work going on in this area. Project 3.2 is adding seismic uh, stiffness to the, to the structure to give the seismic retrofit. And this would be to reduce the story drifts, as I mentioned previously, and to protect, protect brittle elements in the structure. What you see here is a retrofit that taking, was taking place in Mexico City in 1986 following the major earthquake. They're adding shear walls to the end of the structure. They're adding walls to, the, to both sides of the structure as well to give uh, an improved performance of the structure. Here we see an example in uh, North Vancouver where a hospital is being retrofit using um, diagonal bracing placed on the exterior of the building so as not to interrupt the function of the hospital. Project 3.3 uh, looks at using innovative materials such as using uh, carbon fiber wrap. It's a material uh, that's woven with carbon fibers which are very strong and the carbon fiber wrap is then epoxied to the columns and improves uh, the performance of the column. It serves in it as an external hoop, if you like, a continuous hoop. Uh, we have a particular problem in Quebec with corrosion of reinforcement, particularly in buildings such as parking garage structures where the salt-laden cars come in and deposit the salt in the very warm, heated garage. And that's just ideal for corrosion and that's an issue we have to deal with. And of course, our bridges as well have a problem with corrosion, which we must account for. Just to give you an idea of an, an example of one project that's just completed, looking at deficient, poorly detailed, reinforced concrete shear walls. Here's the shear wall, uh, very, very thin, as it was very common back in the 60s, 1960s. Uh, today we'd use thicker walls, hopefully. And at the base we have a lap splice where the bars are overlapped at the base of the wall, a very poor detail. To test it, we turned it on its side and we applied the reverse cyclic loading at the tip of the wall to simulate the earthquake effects. And it has very poor details. And the reversed cyclic loading response is what we look at. And what we see here is that the response is very brittle. It fails in a very brittle manner. We have two different specimens with different amounts of reinforcement. But the failure is in the lap splice in both cases, where the bars are overlapped and a very, very, a very poor detail to have the lap splices in a critical section. While looking at the retrofit of these walls, what we used was carbon fiber wrap around the walls. As you can see, this is a cross section of the wall. And there's the carbon fiber wrap. And here's the application of the carbon fiber wrap on the test specimen. And um, this carbon fiber wrap, as I mentioned, is epoxied to the concrete. The concrete surface is prepared. And then the epoxy takes place. And this is very high strength. And when you look at the response, the response is totally changed now. This is the reverse cyclic loading response. This is the load and the deflection at the tip of the wall. And as you can see, there's more energy absorption, much improved performance uh, for this particular case. Unreinforced masonry walls. 
A lot of testing has been done at the University of British Columbia on in-plane loading of the walls. Here you can see the failure of a concrete block wall. And you can see the load deflection response from the reverse cyclic loading at the top of the wall in the plane of the wall results in very poor brittle performance. Looking at the retrofit of these masonry, uh, unreinforced masonry walls, I'll just talk about the one on the left, an unreinforced masonry infill wall. So it's got masonry infill blocks in a concrete frame. And this is the carbon fiber uh, wrap that has been glued to both sides of the wall to see how the, the performance has improved. The idea is to have a very simple, uh, inexpensive way of retrofitting the masonry wall. And in looking at the masonry wall retrofit, there's a lot of work going on at the University of Ottawa and Carleton University looking at ways of anchoring this carbon fiber wrap. This is a, just a masonry wall, plain masonry wall, in plane loading, reverse cyclic loading. And then how do you anchor this wrap to the floor slab below? Well, they're developing these new anchors. This is the carbon fiber wrap that is splayed outwards, epoxied to the wrap that's already epoxied to the wall. And then this part is embedded and epoxied into a hole in the slab below. So these are different techniques that we are looking at. Project three is on seismic upgrade with base isolation. Well, this is used uh, mainly for bridges. One of the aspects that we're, one of the deliverables is to develop evaluation and retrofit guidelines. And unfortunately, we don't have any up-to-date guidelines in Canada for evaluating existing structures. So this is a major deliverable that we're working on. And we held a meeting just towards the end of November to kick this off. We have to deliver this, the Canadian evaluation and retrofit guidelines, uh, by the end of the network. Now, I just wanted to <clears throat> come to, to a close by, by saying that we have over 35 partner organizations. We, we have a lot of students, but we have partners in the federal government agencies, in the provincial agencies, in municipalities. We have um, partner organizations in, in consulting engineering firms. They're, they're using, they want to, to see the results of our research and are also advising us, which is very helpful. We have uh, utilities and industry, including the insurance industry. And we have emergency preparedness agencies, which are linked to our network. Now, I'd just like to point out the major role played by the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction, ICLR. A lot of collaborative research is going on between our network the Canadian Seismic Research Network, which we call CSRN, and ICLR. The, at the University of Western Ontario, we have Gail Atkinson and Christy, Christy Tiempo, who just arrived. Good to see you. You'll be presenting later. Uh, doing a lot of innovative work and interactions with ICLR. Also looking at risk studies of Canadian urban centers with ICLR. That's uh, marvelous to have that linkage technology transfer. We often have briefings on our research progress uh, at ICLR to keep ICLR and key players in the insurance industry up to date with our research. Um, we have over 150 graduate students, that's masters and PhD students involved in the network research. And each year we award two $2,500 ICLR scholarships to graduate students in the network. And here you see two very happy winners at our annual meeting uh, in Vancouver uh, the, a year ago. So one other point is that Paul Kovacs is a member of the board of directors of the Canadian Seismic Research Network. And just to let you know that Paul plays a major role He's an enthusiastic individual. He's great to have on board, gives us lots of ideas. 
and it was one of our chances to thank him pub publicly. So thank you for that, Paul. Um, the network website, you can go on to the web at www.csrn.mcgill.ca. Our programs are described there. Some of the latest research findings will be on that website, and we'd love to, to hear from you. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Dennis. Pretty impressive. All of that going on in Canada right now. Um, any questions for Dennis? Not on the specific research, because we're going to go through that during the day, but about the network, perhaps, before we move on to John Adams? Okay, thanks, Dennis. Uh, just a remarkably impressive program. Uh, and ICLR is delighted to uh, be able to be affiliated with this terrific uh, team of researchers. 